V has come to. Just last week on Tuesday, Tech Magazine and website Wired dropped an exclusive interview on details about the upcoming PlayStation 5 with Mark Cerny, who's the longtime developer at Sony and also the lead architect for the PlayStation 4. Now, this is a big deal for obvious reasons. One, because it's the PS5, and two, because Sony isn't appearing at E3 this year, and they also didn't host a PlayStation Experience event last year, so PS5 details have been kinda slim. So, as the title suggests, what's the deal with these details, and what exactly are my thoughts on it? Now, to give a quick recap for those who didn't see the article, the PlayStation 5 will boast these features. Backwards compatibility with PS4 titles, new CPU and GPU hardware, because duh, of course, support for ray tracing, solid state drive storage by default, support for 8K displays, and the PS5 will likely launch sometime in 2020 or beyond. Some of these features are pretty cool, some are a big question mark, others I don't really care for, and there are some things I'd like to hear from Sony that they are a bit hush about. Maybe we'll hear about these at a later time. But let's take what we do now and try to break this down piece by piece. Backwards compatibility was one of the last features mentioned in the article, almost towards the end in a kind of short sentence, but for me, this is one of the biggest features. Sony has been slacking really hard with backwards compatibility support this generation. PlayStation Now was their attempt at filling this gap, but unless you have blazing fast internet, streaming those PS3 titles just really isn't worth it for $20 a month. Details are slim on how the BC program will work, but the impression that I get is that if you own the game, you'll be able to play it on the PS5. I'd really like to see if this will also work for digital games, or if their approach will be similar to Microsoft, where it's a slowly growing list of games, so not everything is supported at once, but the trade-off is a host of new enhancements for each game. And now there's 8K! 8K! Wow! <laughs> right? 8K being thrown into the mix sounds really odd at first since, well, 8K TVs don't exist yet. But I think this is for just future-proofing and to avoid the problem that happened with this generation with consoles not supporting 4K output until much later down the line. Since details are slim, I don't really have a lot else to say on this, but I do think future-proofing for 8K is a pretty smart idea on their part. Now, there's a huge chunk of the article dedicated to a demonstration on SSDs, and this is where the big question mark for me popped up. SSDs are getting cheaper and more common by the year. In fact, most electronic devices these days have some sort of flash storage built inside of them. I think consoles are probably one of the few areas of computing devices where SSDs just aren't really as common as they ought to be. But, SSDs being the default right out the bat raises more questions than it answers. How much storage space can we expect to get out of it, and depending on the response to that, how much would the console cost as a result? Because the truth is, SSDs are getting cheaper, but they still aren't exactly cheap. A 1TB SSD on Amazon can cost you well over $100, twice as much as a hard disk drive of the same capacity. But what really got the noggin jogging for me was a little comment in the article describing the PS5's SSD as not being your typical off-the-shelf drive, but something, quote, a little more specialized, end quote. Again, there's no hard details on this, but many, and myself included, have a bit of a suspicion that maybe this could be some kind of proprietary drive from Sony custom made and tailored just for the console. Now if you have a keen memory, you would know that Sony is no stranger to making proprietary media that can only be used on their products, and this goes outside their video game stuff. Though they have gotten a lot more lenient about it over the years, you know, especially since the 2010s. I don't really think Sony will make the same mistake with the Vita's Memory 6, but I am looking forward with both intrigue and caution on more details about this special SSD. Because frankly, I don't want to spend my future always playing on a hard disk drive. They're not great, they kind of suck. But, um, 
I don't know. I don't know about this. I don't know. Now, for that last part, the, the real star of the show, the graphics. This is what a huge portion of the article was dedicated to and what a lot of people on the internet were getting hyped over. And I, I don't really know how to put this, uh, so I guess I'll just say it outright. I really, really don't care. Now, does, it, does this mean that I don't think that this stuff is important? No, not at all. It's just that I have reached a point where the games that have really impressed me the most with their visuals over the years have not been the games that are like the most graphically demanding or like super detailed looking. If anything, what I'd like to see more out of developers for the next generation is putting out games with way better performance on console. I would really, really like to see more and more games, especially AAA games, running at a rock solid 60 frames a second. 3D games have been around since the mid 90s and 60 FPS still isn't yet the standard and I think that's a little bit disappointing. I don't care about ray tracing, I don't care about how many follicles of hair we'll be able to see on Nathan Drake's ass crack. None of that stuff makes games run better, in fact they make them run worse. 60 FPS gameplay should not only just be a reality for PC gaming. So with this new powerful hardware, let's try to do things a bit differently this gen. Please. And hey, Sony, by the way. If you're listening to this, this is a small thing, but could you please, please give the PS5 4K Blu-ray support? I would have dropped the cash for a PS4 Pro, but for whatever reason, you decided that 4K Blu-rays just aren't that important, despite the main selling point of the Pro being all about 4K. My game consoles have always been my primary means for multimedia on my TV, home video streaming, music while gaming, etc. Boost mode is cool, but you know what's even cooler? Watching the fifth element in 4K. Pop it, D-Man! Uh, hi. Unbelievable! I think it's really just baffling, just confusing that Microsoft is doing a better job at this than Sony. Both the Xbone S and the Xbone X support 4K Blu-ray. Yes, even the Xbone S which is cheaper and less powerful than the Pro, supports this feature. Sony, the conglomerate that is the leading company behind the Blu-ray medium, makes Blu-ray players, makes 4K Blu-ray players, sells Ultra HD movies, one of which I own, decided this was a thing that just wasn't bothering to support, just didn't matter. And even the X-Bone S can natively output 4K in some circumstances in upscale games, which is also something that the PS4 Slim can't do. Sony's made a big deal, a lot of you know pomp and circumstance about 4K in the latter half of this generation, but to me, it's Microsoft that has done a much better job at this. Maybe next generation will be different. I don't know, because I sure hope so. So that's that for the article. Uh, that's pretty much it for my thoughts on the PS5. Sony has had a really strong start and momentum at the beginning of this generation, but towards the latter part of this generation where we are right now, I think they've really, really been slacking and getting very lazy. Uh, their confrontational stance on crossplay features, their previous stance on name changing, and like insisting that it's something that couldn't be couldn't be done, and then kind of backpedaling on that when they actually were able to do it. Uh, the awkwardness that is the PS4 Pro and their just whole approach to 4K, as I mentioned before, their progressively stale E3 presentations, and their bizarre, weird about face on censoring. Microsoft and Nintendo may not have the number one spot that PlayStation has right now, but everything else those two companies are doing is just way more interesting to me than whatever Sony is doing with the PlayStation. Microsoft has been running laps with their BC program and breaking ground with their accessibility controller and finally, finally treating the Windows platform as a core part of the brand instead of just this weird exception. Nintendo has also come back in a really big way with the Switch, which has become both a, a haven for small indie titles and a technical wonder uh, with AAA games on the go. 
Sony looks to be maintaining the status quo, and maybe that's not such a bad thing for a console, but I feel that in this upcoming generation, I think that you're going to need a bit more than just the status quo. They gave a very flowery explanation for skipping E3 and the PlayStation experience, going on about how the events don't really suit their needs or something like that, but I think that's just a load of BS, and that the real reason is just that they really don't have anything to show for the PS5 yet. Even this surprise tease still felt like they were still ironing out a lot of things, and they just don't really have anything concrete yet, throwing around a lot of buzzwords while not exactly giving the whole picture. But, I guess that's just the games industry for you. But hey, maybe the radiant silence isn't so bad. Maybe this time out of the spotlight will actually give Sony the focus needed to really hammer out something fantastic. This generation hasn't really felt all that groundbreaking to me, but I have a good feeling that this upcoming one will definitely change that. <laughs>